Good Thursday morning. I'm Joe Fryer. And I'm Lindsay Reiser in for Savannah. We've got a lot to cover on this first morning of July, so let's get right to it. Right now on Morning News Now, overturned. Bill Cosby is out of prison and back home this morning following a stunning decision to reverse the disgraced comedian's 2018 aggravated indecent assault conviction. Why Pennsylvania's highest court threw out the case and reaction from the dozens from dozens of his accusers. Death toll climbing. The bodies of two children have been recovered at the site of that condo collapse in Surfside, Florida. That brings a death toll to 18 this morning. President Biden and the First Lady are set to arrive at the site later today. We will preview their visit and bring you the latest on the search and rescue efforts. Trouble brewing. Multiple sources tell NBC News the Trump Organization and its chief financial officer, Alan Weisselberg, are now formally indicted by a New York grand jury on tax crimes. Weisselberg, just moments ago, surrendering to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. Inside the charges and what's next for the former president. And petition dashed. Britney Spears' emotional plea to remove her father from her conservatorship denied by a Los Angeles judge how the controversial case could play out from here. Everybody, of course, all eyes on Brittany. And I think a lot of people were thinking that something might be different after hearing that incredible testimony. But we're going to dig into some of those court records. Yeah, we're keeping our legal analysts busy this morning. (laughs) Absolutely. This morning, we are going to begin, though, with Bill Cosby, who is now a free man after the Pennsylvania Supreme Court overturned his aggravated indecent assault conviction. Cosby was found guilty in 2018, one of the first high profile cases of the Me Too movement. Yesterday, after spending nearly three years behind bars, the 83 year old comedian an actor walked out of prison and went back to his Pennsylvania home. NBC News correspondent Ron Allen has been following this case from the very start. He joins us from outside Cosby's home in Elkins Park, Pennsylvania. So Ron Cosby is back home for the first time in three years. But how did he get there? What's behind this ruling on his conviction? Well, through, through it all, Cosby has been waging a very aggressive fight for his freedom, claiming that he wasn't treated fairly during this entire process. The Supreme Court didn't focus so much on the facts of the case, the allegations that Andrea Constance made against Cosby. It focused on the fact that back in 2004, not long after this case first happened, uh, that Cosby essentially struck a deal with a prosecutor at the time uh, to testify in a civil proceeding in exchange for a promise that he would not be charged criminally. The prosecutor at the time, Bruce Castor, didn't feel that he had a strong enough case. So he made this agreement in an attempt, as he put it, to try and get Constance a, a measure of justice. So Cosby did this deposition that lasted several days. It, it runs thousands of pages. And he made all kinds of statements that were relatively incriminating uh, about the Constance incident and also about his relationships with other women, where he talked about his fame, where he talked about how he even used drugs like Quaaludes, the 1970s party drug, to to help him seduce young women in in Hollywood. Uh, And the uh, the judges on the Supreme Court essentially found that 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 uh, the case never should have been brought against Cosby because he had been promised that he would not be prosecuted. Joe, Lindsay. So, Ron, Cosby spoke with a Pennsylvania radio show about his release yesterday. What did he have to say in his own words? Again, he maintained that he was not treated fairly. He says that this is justice. Uh, He spoke to WDAS. Here's some of what he had to say. Take a listen. This is not just a black thing. Mm. This is for all the people who have been imprisoned wrongfully, regardless of race, color, or creed. Mm -hmm. Because I, I met them in there. People who talked about what happened and what they did. And I know there are many liars out there, but these people can't get lawyers. It's important to point out that he was not exonerated. Uh, His accusers and others are saying that he was freed on a a technicality. He says it's fairness. Andrea Constance, the woman who made the allegations that led to the conviction some years ago, said that she was disappointed and was very worried about the chilling effect this could have on other women and other victims of of, of sexual assault uh, and their their willingness to come forward. Again, this is one of the first big cases of the Me Too era, and uh, its repercussions um, will be interesting to see how wide they spread. But again, uh, a lot of disappointment, a lot of anger amongst more than 50 other women who had accused Cosby over the years of sexual assault. If he 
course, is a disgraced figure. He has very little support in any community. And he's here with his supporters. Uh, he's said a few things, um, and we expect to hear from, more from him, probably. Uh, but again, he was not exonerated, um, but he is a free man. And the justice has also said that their ruling, he cannot be tried on these charges again. Ron, speaking of those other accusers, we are hearing from Gloria Allred, the high profile attorney who represents several of Cosby's other accusers. What does she want to happen next? Well, she hopes and other advocates hope that other victims will still come forward and that this does not dissuade them. It's a tough thing to do. It's an extremely difficult thing to do, obviously. Remember, this case took many, many years to come to fruition. Uh, here's what some of here's some of what Ms. Allred had to say. I do believe that this was a very important fight for justice. And even though the court did overturn the conviction, it was on technical grounds. It did not vindicate Bill Cosby's conduct, and it should not be interpreted as a statement or a finding that he did not engage in the acts of which he has been accused. Again, she's calling it a technicality. Cosby and his supporters are calling it an issue of fairness, which is something that the, the justices did, in fact, say. But again, he was not exonerated. He is a free man, however. And in a very unusual ruling, the justices said that he cannot be tried on these cases again. And although there are other accusers out there, uh, it's believed that most of these cases, if not all of them, have exceeded the statute of limitations. So it appears that Cosby's criminal problems on these matters are, are done. All right, Ron Allen, starting off our coverage this morning. Ron, thanks so much. And speaking of Cosby's accusers, several of them are speaking out about his release from prison, and some described it as a gut punch. Others said they were disgusted by the decision. NBC News senior national correspondent Kate Snow has more on their reactions. Joe and Lindsay, more than 50 women over the years have come forward with allegations against Bill Cosby, everything from harassment to sexual assault, which he has denied. But when he was convicted, they saw it as a victory for all of them. So Wednesday's court decision reversing that conviction was stunning. Andrea Constant reacting to the decision, calling it not only disappointing, but of concern in that it may discourage those who seek justice for sexual assault in the criminal justice system from reporting or participating in the prosecution of the assailant. Her fellow accusers distraught. Janice Baker Kinney texted, she's angry, frustrated, sad, all the emotions, and sick to my stomach. Victoria Valentino said she didn't believe it when she first heard. I'm outraged. I'm infuriated. How anybody could uh, allow a little legal glitch to release a sociopath, a narcissistic, uh, pathological, lying predator, rapist, who had no concern, no feeling, no remorse. Cosby was never charged with rape and denied all allegations against him. Heidi Thomas was one of the five women who testified in support of Constant about her own experience. I am furious with all of the enablers over five decades of enablers. And today, the way I feel, the Supreme Court of Pennsylvania is an enabler. Do you still feel no. some vindication that the jury believed you? No. It's it's that sucker punch is is basically saying it doesn't matter what happened to you. It doesn't matter what happened to over 50 women who have told their stories. It's an absolute affront. It's a slap in the face. It's an insult. Many do not see a legal path for another case, but some say they're not giving up. There is much more to say and do, Eden Turrell said, if the Me Too movement is going to mean anything at all in the future. When I sat down with Andrea Constant in 2018 exclusively, she told me that she didn't feel like she alone took down Bill Cosby. She felt like she was part of a broader collective. And in that statement her team put out, they thanked the others who had come forward, the other accusers, and said they hope that victims will still find their voice. Back to you. As we said at the top of the show, we're keeping our legal analysts busy this morning. Let's bring in NBC News legal analyst Danny Savalo. So, Danny, this ruling is because that previous prosecutor, Bruce Castor, decided not to charge Cosby at the time, a so-called due process violation. First, here's what Cosby's attorney said about it. 
over. <laughs> um, as far as we understand it, the, the high court vacated the conviction, uh, discharged him, and uh, thankfully they saw it the way that we saw it, which we always believed full, fully that uh, he never should have been prosecuted because there was an agreement made. He relied on that agreement, and you can't have a system where prosecutors don't hold up to their words. We so, Danny, can you help us understand this and explain how this works? Sure. Prosecutors decide not to prosecute someone all the time. What they don't normally do is release a public press statement signed by the DA, uh, leading everyone, including Cosby, to believe that you will, he will never be prosecuted. And relying on that promise, according to the Supreme Court, Cosby gave up his Fifth Amendment rights and sat down for a civil deposition, which exposed him to criminal and civil liability and, in fact, led to criminal responsibility for Cosby. Even if there was not a contract, the court applied what's called promissory estoppel, the principle that even where a contract fails, if one party makes a promise to another and there is detrimental reliance on that promise, the promise should be enforced. And the court concluded the only way to enforce this promise was to vacate the conviction and take that extra step of barring prosecution. So, Danny, of note here is the state Supreme Court said Cosby cannot be retried on the same charges. Could he face a similar charge down the line or is it too late? Of course, it's possible with some new victim and some new case that falls within the statute of limitations. But uh, a, that would require somebody who has never come out to come out and say that, oh, I was assaulted X number of years ago. And it would have to be within, say, the 12 year statute of limitations for this particular charge. Of course, there are other statutes for other crimes in Pennsylvania. But uh, it seems unlikely. But of course, it's theoretically possible. All right, Danny Savalos. Thanks so much, Danny. Appreciate all your expertise on this. President Biden and the First Lady are headed to Surfside, Florida later this morning, and they're meeting with first responders and local officials at the site of the partially collapsed condo building. And the meeting comes as the body of two young children were found, pushing the death toll up to 18, with 145 people still unaccounted for. NBC News correspondent Ellison Barber is on the ground for us now. Ellison, devastating news about those two children. What's the latest with the search and rescue efforts? Yeah, Lindsay, as you said, 18 lives now confirmed to have been lost in this collapse. We have the names of four new additional victims. Among the 18 lives lost, there is an entire family, the Gara family, Marcus, Annalee, and their two daughters, Lucia and Emma, all lost their lives in the collapse. Lucia was just 10 years old. Emma only four. They lived on the eighth floor, two doors down from a couple named Nicole Langisfeld and Luis Sadovnik. They are among the 140 plus people still unaccounted for. As of this morning, as far as we're aware, the rescue efforts, the search, it continues. I spoke to a member of the Miami-Dade Urban Search and Rescue Team, also known as Florida Task Force One, yesterday, and she said that this is challenging for rescuers, not only tactically, logistically, and physically, but also emotionally, because this is their community, too. Listen here guys and gals that are working on that pile, there are times that they are breaking down. They, they break down sometimes on the pile itself because it is hard. It is hard when you're going through that pile and you suddenly find a toy and you suddenly find a, a picture of a family. And all of these, it, it keeps reminding us that we are looking for people. We're looking for people's family members. We're looking for their loved ones. There's a memorial not far from here. It's actually just outside of a Catholic church that, according to local reports, the Gara family attended and were heavily involved with. There are photos of people who are among the missing, unaccounted for, and now some of them among the identified victims. There are also stuffed animals, teddy bears. Some of them were placed there by rescuers who actually found them in the rubble. Lindsay. Just 10 and four years old, Ellison. Um, it's absolutely heartbreaking. And obviously the search and rescue continues. But we also heard last night that engineers from the same organization that investigated the aftermath of the 9-11 attacks are also going to look into this. What can you tell us about that? Yeah, I mean, in addition to the immediate efforts of trying to save lives as if possible and if, if not recover uh, the victims that are still underneath that rubble, there is also the 
efforts and the demand for accountability. At least four lawsuits have been filed related to this, most of them filed against the Condo Association. A grand jury is expected to look into this. And now NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, has officially launched a full technical investigation, very similar to what they did after 9-11, to try and understand how this building was constructed, modified, and also maintained. They're, they say their mission, uh, their investigation runs secondary to any sort of criminal or uh, something along those lines, that type of criminal investigation. But it's something that can potentially down the road lead to changes in building code standards. Listen to some of uh, how they described it at a press conference yesterday evening. This will be a fact finding, not fault finding technical investigation. It will take time, possibly a couple of years, but we will not stop until we have determined the likely cause of this tragedy. We are going in with an open mind. In any building collapse, we would want to understand how the building was designed, how it was constructed, modified, and maintained. And this has been on the ground for a couple days now, but they've officially launched this investigation as of yesterday evening. They say that they will not interfere with any of the ongoing search and rescue efforts. Lindsay. All right, Ellison Barber, uh, live in Surfside, Florida. Ellison, thank you for your reporting. A massive fireworks explosion in Los Angeles has left at least 17 people injured, including 10 law enforcement officers yesterday. Everyone is expected to be okay. The Los Angeles police were seizing more than 5,000 pounds of commercial grade fireworks in South Central LA when it happened. They tried to dispose of just 10 pounds of small improvised explosives in an armored vehicle, but the force of the blast destroyed the entire truck. You just saw that right now on your screen, the force of that blast. This is the aftermath here on your screen. Not much of that truck left. And the explosion, obviously so big, it shattered windows, so damaging several cars and nearby homes there in the area. A 27-year-old man has been arrested so far. He's accused of importing the fireworks from out of state with plans to resell them for the July 4th weekend. We're learning more about the deadly impact of this past week's extreme weather. In the northwest, excessive heat killed more than 60 people in a region that rarely sees such high temperatures. Yeah, Bill Karens is joining us now. So, Bill, what is the weather looking like now ahead of the 4th of July weekend? Are we kind of out of the, the woods here? Uh, as far as the heat wave goes, it's still hot in the northwest, but it's not record breaking. It's just maybe we want to call it like uncomfortable. Uh, the northeast is over with with their heat wave. And yesterday, by the way, Newark Airport hit 103 degrees. It was the hottest that Newark Airport had ever been in the month of June. So that was a, a record that was on the East Coast. So as far as what concerns we have right now, 35 million people are under flash flood watches. That's probably the biggest concern. We've had some overnight flash flooding around Indianapolis. There's some very heavy rain in southern portions of Ohio. And all of this wet weather is going to slide towards the mid-Atlantic. And it's going to move slowly, too. So as far as severe weather goes, yesterday we had a lot of wind damage with those thunderstorms in the northeast. Today, a couple areas from about Washington, D.C., Baltimore, southwards, the southern portion of the Jersey Shore, Maryland, Delaware, and areas from Norfolk, Virginia Beach, towards Richmond and Fredericksburg. Damaging wind once again, isolated. I don't think there's going to be a ton of it out there today. And how about this? At 5 a.m. this morning, the National Hurricane Center said, yep, another tropical system. This is Tropical Storm. Elsa, this one is out in the Atlantic. It has about two or three days until it gets towards areas like the Windward Islands near Lake St. Lucia. But as we go through the holiday weekend, we have to keep an eye on this because by the time we get to Monday night and Tuesday, this should be near Florida as a tropical storm. So, guys, you know, there's no rest at all this summer. It's like heat waves, flash flooding, uh, tropical systems. It looks like it's going to be a uh, one of those summers. Keeping you busy for sure, Bill. All right. Thank you, Bill. Another big story we're following this morning. NBC News has learned a New York grand jury has indicted the Trump organization as well as its longtime CFO, Alan Weisselberg. Two sources familiar with the matter confirmed the indictments to NBC News. And new this morning, Weisselberg has surrendered to the office of the Manhattan District Attorney. That happened a little after 6 a.m. Now, the specific charges were not immediately clear, but it is expected the indictment will be unsealed this afternoon, according to a representative with the Trump team. We do know that that these are state charges, not federal ones, and therefore potential 
tax crimes. Let's bring in NBC News correspondent for investigations, Tom Winter, who's been up late through the night reporting on all these developments. So, Tom, these indictments are three years in the making. What do we know about the case? Joe, I think this is going to be specifically tied to benefits uh, in compensation off the books that Alan Weisselberg and others may have received uh, as a result of their work for the Trump organization and whether or not that was correctly accounted for. Uh, you can be bet if they're moving forward with an indictment, they're going to say that it was not correctly accounted for and properly handled. So that's where I think this is going to center around today. Um, as you suggested, Alan uh, Weisselberg uh, is, in fact, uh, uh, at the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. He turned himself in around 620 this morning. The Trump organization and Alan Weisselberg will be in court sometime around 2 p.m., we're told, uh, according to a person familiar with the matter on the Trump side of things, uh, later today. And at that point, we'll know the specific charges that they're expected to face, Joe. So, Tom, do prosecutors want something out of Alan Weisselberg in terms of cooperation? And if so, what are they looking for here? I think that's exactly where they're going with this, is kind of an opening salvo and an investigation that, as you said, is over three years old. It's been just a little bit over four months, four months and seven days since they've gotten Donald Trump's tax returns. And really, Alan Alan Weisselberg, as the chief financial officer, is going to be the person who knows why the Trump organization did what it did with respect to its finances. And that's where this investigation centers around. So if you're going to get somebody who's going to eventually perhaps cooperate, testify, provide information, Alan Weisselberg is really one of the keys to that. And Tom, important to note here, former President Trump has not been indicted. But does he face perhaps any legal or financial trouble down the road? Well, not today, but I mean, I think long term, that's going to be the ultimate question that, that we're going to have to try to figure out, Joe. It, and it's really up to the Manhattan District Attorney's Office. What documents do they have and what information can they get if it does, in fact, lead to Donald Trump? And Tom, what other avenues are investigators looking at in terms of any other potential crimes? You know, one thing we're not talking about today is something that Cy Vance and his attorney said, the Manhattan District Attorney said uh, in their court filings, which is the, this idea of bank fraud and potential insurance fraud crimes. Uh, they've included that in the past as something that they are looking into. They wouldn't say that if they didn't think those were avenues to pursue. So we haven't heard anything about that today. Again, just another indication why we think this investigation is going to continue uh, far beyond today's indictment. And we know you'll stay on it. Tom Winter, thanks so much for your reporting this morning. Appreciate it. Coming up, New York City is still without a Democratic nominee for mayor more than a week after Election Day. Now, that alone is not surprising, but the chaos surrounding the process is. Yeah, the Board of Elections blunder at the center of the delay and the latest tallies next. A major ballot counting error in the race for New York City mayor has rocked an already chaotic primary season. The New York City Board of Elections accidentally counted 135,000 test ballots. Eric Adams, who still leads the pack by a slim margin of error, filed a lawsuit Wednesday over this. He's asking for a judge to oversee the process from here on out. NBC News has also learned that the New York City Board of Elections did not accept repeated offers of support from the group behind the vote counting software. NBC News Now correspondent Dasha Burns joins us now. So, Dasha, the Board of Elections is classifying the vote count snafu as human error. Can you tell us what happened and how they're explaining it? Hey, Lindsay. Yeah, what happened is actually fairly simple. Uh, the Board of Elections neglected to clear the system of the dummy ballots that they were using to test the system. But what is surprising is that nobody caught the 100,000 plus additional ballots before releasing those preliminary results. And according to the elections experts that I've been speaking with, they say it seems that the Board of Elections simply didn't have those critical safeguards in place, the redundancy mechanisms for double checking that are so critical in this kind of highly charged election. And what we learned in our reporting yesterday is uh, that those safeguards were offered to the Board of Elections. I spoke with the president of the Ranked Choice Voting Resource Center, the group behind the software that the city is using in this election. They say that they offered help many times over, both in the forms of education and training, but also in the form of parallel tabulation and blind review that they say uh, would have prevented something like this. I asked the Board of Elections why they didn't accept the help, and the spokesperson simply responded via email saying that this wasn't a software issue. It was due to human error. Uh, the Board of Elections also putting out a statement of apologizing for this, uh, saying yesterday's ranked choice voting reporting error was unacceptable, and we apologize to the voters and the campaigns for the confusion. Let us be clear, ranked choice was not the problem. It was 
human error that could have been avoided, Lindsay. Hmm. All right. Well, Dasha, we mentioned Eric Adams is suing. How are the other candidates taking this? You can imagine they're pretty frustrated, as many uh, New Yorkers are with this. I want you to hear what Catherine Garcia had to say to my colleague Chuck Todd. Take a listen. Rank choice voting isn't that complicated to do once you have all the data, uh, but certainly if you have information in that's not correct, then it's going to be problematic. Uh, but it sounds like it was just human error, and it reminds me of you know my fifth grade teacher. Please double check your work. And the Adams campaign also putting out a statement about their next steps, saying that they petitioned uh, the court to preserve a right to a fair election process and to have a judge oversee and review the ballots if necessary, saying they're inviting other campaigns uh, to join the petition as well, Lindsay. I mean, Dasha, in the, in the statement that you read just a couple of minutes ago, I, I sense a little bit of defensiveness uh, there in their response to you. I mean, uh, let's be real. This is the biggest ranked choice voting test for the country yet. How are New York state leaders handling this? That's right. And, and what's interesting and important to note is that this error really had nothing to do with ranked choice as a system. But you can't ignore the fact that this is coming with the backdrop and the context of the 2020 race. And a lot of Americans who still believe in the false claims of voter fraud from uh, former President Trump, a lot of folks that are still very skeptical of our election system. So there are a lot uh, of eyes on this, and you better bet that they are going to be watching very closely. Uh, the uh, New York State Senate Majority Leader, uh, Andrea Stewart Cousins, put out a statement saying that the situation in New York is a national embarrassment and must be dealt with properly and promptly. In the coming weeks, the Senate will hold hearings on the situation and will seek to pass reform legislation as a result, at the earliest opportunity, uh, people are going to be watching this really, really closely, Lindsay. Wow, pretty strong statement. All right, Dasha, thanks so much. Good to see you. Thanks a lot. Let's take a look at what's making news around the world this morning. Yeah. NBC News foreign correspondent Claudio Lavanga joins us now from Rome. Claudio, good morning. Good morning, Lindsay. Good morning, Joe. Well, today, China marked the centenary of the ruling Communist Party with a spectacular military parade, artistic performances, and a defiant message by President Xi Jinping. Now, the president warned foreign powers not to influence or preach China, otherwise they'll get their heads bashed. Now, some say this, some think that this was a, a message directed, veiled uh, to the United States. Well, now, uh, the surge in COVID-19 cases in Scotland uh, linked somehow to the ongoing European football championship has raised concerns that the sporting event may pose a threat to public safety. Now, new data suggest that almost 2,000 Scottish fans, many of whom travelled last week to London to watch Scotland play England, uh, have contracted coronavirus either at the stadium or at gatherings organised to watch the games. And do you remember that massive pile-up at the opening of the Tour de France? Well, now the police has identified and arrested a woman who suspected to have caused it. Now, the video of the incident shows a woman who's holding this big, by the roadside, who's holding a big homemade cardboard sign with granny and granddad written in Germany. The problem was that she was looking at the cameras rather at the riders at the riders who were coming from the back. One of the cyclists rode straight into the sign, fell, uh, created the dominant effect and a pileup of cyclists. Well, I suppose that if she's found guilty, granny and granddad can go and say Auf Wiedersehen to her in prison. Oh. Guys. There you go. Maybe they'll bring a sign. It was only a matter of time. It's I can't like, believe she took cameras. off. I know. Oh my gosh. Yeah. All right. Claudio, thanks so much. Coming up, Facebook's new push to highlight Black-owned businesses on Instagram. The app's latest profile editions. Next. Instagram is making it easier for you to support Black-owned businesses. The app announced that companies in the U.S. can add a new Black-owned label to their profiles. The company says that more than 1.3 million Instagram posts included Black-owned or Black-led during the racial reckoning in the summer and fall of last year. So businesses can display the new label in their bios on Instagram's shop. So good idea there. Yeah, absolutely. Long awaited. Well, the Delta variant has been confirmed in all 50 states and it's threatening now to explode in pockets of the country where vaccination rates are low. 
NBC News Now correspondent Isa Gutierrez is following the latest coronavirus headlines this morning. Isa, good morning. How is this variant impacting restrictions that are still in place across the country? Good morning, Lindsay. Well, we're seeing that local governments are reconsidering their indoor mask mandates. So, of course, back in May, we saw that the CDC changed their guidelines, saying that people who were fully vaccinated no longer had to wear masks indoors. However, recently we heard from the World Health Organization earlier this week saying that they still recommend that everyone, regardless of their vaccination status, wear masks indoors because of the Delta variant. So we've seen this week Los Angeles County in California following suit, reversing their indoor mask mandate, saying that as a precautionary measure, uh, you know, recommending that people still wear those masks. We're seeing that in the state of Connecticut, Governor Lamont is saying that he will not be lifting the indoor mask mandate for schools for the upcoming school year yet until he gets more information on the Delta variant from federal health officials. Here's Dr. Fauci. There are certain pockets of under-vaccinated areas of the country where we could see a threat with this variant, which has the capability of spreading quite efficiently from person to person. Experts have reiterated that these masks are to protect people who have not yet been vaccinated. As we've seen recent studies show, and, and as recent as this week, we saw a new study from Moderna showing that our three vaccines, the J&J, the Pfizer, and the Moderna, do protect against the Delta variant. Now, meanwhile, health officials in cities like Chicago and New York City have said that they do not plan on revisiting uh, the change in their indoor mask mandate, and the CDC has also not indicated uh, that they're re revisiting their guidance either. Lindsay? Well, Nisa, doctors are now saying that people infected with the Delta strain may have symptoms similar to a bad cold. What do people need to watch out for? Yeah, Lindsay, doctors are seeing more upper respiratory complaints. So symptoms like congestion, runny nose, headache. However, they're warning that just because those are the symptoms that you have, you should not be brushing off, uh, you know, COVID-19 as just a bad cold, right? If you have these symptoms, they're urging that you still go and get tested um, for COVID-19. And they're saying that, you know, these uh, more concerning symptoms like shortness of breath uh, and more serious lung problems could still develop. Lindsay? Asa, finally, a grand jury has decided not to charge a Houston doctor accused of stealing doses for the COVID vaccine for friends and family early in the rollout. We've covered this before. What was behind that decision? Lindsay, this comes after a month-long investigation by prosecutors and also two days of testimony. Ultimately, the grand jury decided uh, concluded that they agreed with the Texas Medical Board as well as a judge who earlier this year uh, dismissed a theft charge and an investigation against the doctor, Dr. Hazan Gokal. Now, back in March, the state's medical board said that the doctor appeared to have administered those 10 doses to patients that were properly consented in the eligible patient category and that ultimately those doses would have otherwise been wasted. The board also found that there were no protocols at the time back in December when this happened for the doctor to follow and that he relied on state guidance not to waste the vaccine by giving them out. Now, Dr. Agokal, following uh, the allegation, was fired from his government job. His name has been seen, uh, like you said, in news headlines across the world. Uh, and his attorney says that this decision by the grand jury ends the attempt by prosecution to disparage his name. Lindsay? All right, Isa, thank you for getting us caught up to speed. We appreciate it. Coming up, Britney Spears' fight to remove her father from her conservatorship denied by an L.A. judge. We will break down that ruling next. The judge overseeing Britney Spears' conservatorship denied her petition to have her father removed. And the decision comes one week after Britney testified about the conditions of the conservatorship, calling it abusive and wrong. NBC News national correspondent Miguel Almaguer has more on the ruling. 
Overnight, a major setback for Britney Spears, a judge denying her request to remove her father from his role as conservator, signing an order that keeps Jamie Spears in control of his daughter's finances. The court filing stating that Britney is unable to manage his or her financial resources or to resist fraud or undue influence. The decision coming after the superstar's explosive testimony last week, calling the conservatorships abusive and traumatizing. In new legal filings, Jamie Spears insists he had nothing to do with his daughter's poor treatment and is demanding an investigation into her concerns. Since her very public breakdown in 2008, the pop superstar has been under a court-sanctioned conservatorship that has given her father and others power over her personal and financial affairs. During the explosive hearing last week, Spears said she had been drugged, forced to perform, and prevented from removing an IUD meant to stop pregnancy. All decisions, she says, were approved by her father. But Jamie Spears pushing back, pointing out in new court documents that control of his daughter's personal life and medical treatment isn't currently under his control. He blames Jody Montgomery, a temporary conservator who was brought on in 2019 to oversee Britney's personal affairs. An attorney for Montgomery says she's been a tireless advocate for Britney and for her well-being, also noting that decisions about marriage or family planning are not affected by conservatorship. But one expert says the rules and dynamics in a conservatorship are rarely straightforward. It's my impression that Brittany has been under this conservatorship for so long. She truly feels compelled to do what the conservator wants, or in her own words, she feels she'll be punished. Let Brittany speak! Since Brittany's testimony, there's been an outpouring of support in person, online under the hashtag Free Britney, and from celebrities, including fellow pop star Christina Aguilera just this week. Spears has thanked her fans for their support and said during her testimony, I just want my life back, and it's been 13 years, and it's enough. The online trading platform Robinhood has been slapped with a $70 million fine for causing, quote, widespread and significant harm to customers. It's the biggest fine ever handed out by the Financial Industry Regulatory Authority. NBC News senior business reporter Ben Popkin joins us now with more on this. So, Ben, explain to us why Robinhood is being fined and why this penalty is so high. Well, Robinhood is being hit for a range of violations from breaking regulations to misleading customers uh, that led to an alleged ruinous losses by its customers, including, as cited by FINRA, uh, the suicide of a 20-year-old customer who had thought he had racked up $730,000 in losses, but the stock trading platform was showing him the wrong numbers. Uh, Wall Street regulator FINRA, in a statement, uh, said that Robinhood let more than 800,000 customers make these high-stake bets using what's called margin trading, uh, where they're able to trade using borrowed money. Uh, even if these customers thought they had turned the feature off, uh, the pl trading platform was using poorly designed what are called approval bots to decide whether customers should trade risky options. And uh, they were allowing customers under 21 to do this, uh, even if they had just uh, declared that they were trading options for the last three years. So uh, they were also cited. Everyone remembers the meme stock frenzy uh, that happened in January. That was part of their outages and critical systems failures uh, when customers were locked out of their accounts during during this frenzy that they were cited for. Yeah, and for that very reason, we know Robinhood's been in the news a lot this year. How is the company responding to the order, and could this impact the company's business? to go public. Well, uh, they said that they've made the necessary investments to address these issues, including more than tripling its support staff to a total of 2,700. In a statement, they said they've invested heavily in improving platform stability, building out our customer support and legal and compliance team. We're glad to put this matter behind us. As they filed for that IPO in March. They believe these fines are actually clearing the path for its IPO, that they're the last hurdle it needs to move ahead. Uh, they believe it shows investors, users, policymakers that they're coming in compliance, resolving its long-standing issues. But Robinhood 
is not out of the woods yet. The company still faces legal and regulatory challenges on many fronts. The state of Massachusetts has sued the company for aggressive marketing. The SEC is still reviewing the company's role in the meme stock rally. Uh, they're the ones, the real gatekeepers on that IPO. And the company is a defendant in dozens of class action lawsuits brought by those aggrieved customers. All right. Ben Popkin, thanks for updating on this. Appreciate it. Time now for our CNBC Money Minute, the other big financial headlines of the day and why they matter to you. Yeah, CNBC's Bertha Combs joins us now. Good morning, Bertha. Hey, good morning, Joan, Savannah. So we're all getting back to business. Hertz is as well. It's exiting bankruptcy after more than a year. The rental car company filing for Chapter 11 last May when it was drowning in debt and hit hard by COVID travel restrictions. Hertz says that it's ready to pounce on the rebound in travel. It's revamping operations and adding more electric and hybrid vehicles to its fleet. Also launching new tools to let customers check in without having to stand in line. And the head of Instagram says it's no longer just a photo sharing app. Adam Mosseri says the company is looking to lean into entertainment and video following the success of rivals such as YouTube and TikTok. He says Instagram is working on some upcoming changes. These include showing users recommendations for topics that they're not already following and making videos more immersive through a full screen experience. Separately, Instagram may be working on a subscriber only feature. TechCrunch reports that the stories feature called exclusive stories is similar to super follows on Twitter. It lets creators post exclusive content to their Instagram story that's presumably only available to subscribers. The content would be differentiated in their feeds with a purple tag. When you try to watch an exclusive story without being a subscriber of the person sharing it, you'll see a pop up that says only fans can watch this. That is only fans that pay up for those subscriptions, wow. I would imagine. One more way for those influencers to make coin on Instagram. Yeah, I, I don't know if there's anyone I want to subscribe to. <laughs> I haven't really so. thought about that. Like, <laughs> it's all to just keep you sucked in. Right, yeah. Definitely really good content. All exactly. right, Martha, thanks so much. <laughs> The 4th of July weekend is almost upon us, and according to data from AAA, more than 40 million Americans are expected to hit the roads or skies to celebrate the holiday. So how will a week of record-breaking heat and a nor'easter affect your travel plans? Let's go ahead and bring in the points guy, Brian Kelly, to help us navigate this. Brian, good morning. Good to see you. So, of course, much of the U.S. recovering from scorching temperatures across the country now. A lot of areas expecting rain. There's also the Delta variant to keep in mind. So what's your advice this weekend? Well, if you're going to travel, just be prepared. You know, the travel system, it's its on the verge of a breakdown. Uh, you know, we've seen American Airlines cancel hundreds of flights because of their pilot and labor shortage. You know, there are labor shortages all across the travel industry. So, you know, if you're going to be out there, just be prepared. I highly recommend double check your airline reservations, your hotel and car rental reservations. There have been a lot of changes and cancellations. So just double check that everything's in line before you leave your house. So we know that last year the pandemic had a huge impact on the hospitality and restaurant industries. They obviously lost a lot of money during holiday weekends, especially those places that rely on tourism. So what might be the impact if there's bad weather this time around? I mean, it might not be as bad as last year, but how much of an impact could that have on some of these businesses? Well, the travel companies are back to making money. You know, United Airlines just this week announced they're profitable again. Um, as we saw just now, Hertz is exiting bankruptcy. So things do look good on the horizon. Um, however, all it takes is one storm to really throw our, our whole aviation system out of whack. So, um, but, you know, in general, you know, the future looks bright. The big concern for everyone right now is the Delta variant. The EU is open to American citizens. If you're vaccinated, it's super easy to travel to the EU. However, if this Delta variant spikes, um, we could see closures again. So we're not out of the woods yet, but things do look good for the travel industry. Yeah, Brian, I've uh, booked and canceled now two separate trips because, I don't know, it just wasn't clear. I got worried. So I decided to go somewhere a little bit closer where we live. I know you've been traveling. What's your advice for people who don't want to go really far? 
Well, there's certainly so many beautiful places to go in the U.S. Our national park system is incredible. Just note, though, even some national parks, you need to make reservations. In Hawaii, there are some parks that you have to make reservations to even hike. So my my tip is don't assume things are back to pre-pandemic levels, especially at hotels. You might be paying through the nose and not even getting the perks uh, because, for example, no housekeeping. So just understand what you're paying for before just assuming that everything is back to normal, because it's not. All right. So, Brian, just big picture looking ahead here at 2021 and folks are weighing what they should be doing, what they should be thinking about. What is just your biggest tip for folks? The biggest thing you have to point folks toward as they're considering what to do later this year? I say, you know, so most of the airlines allowed free changes. But in May, they made a sneaky little change that uh, uh, didn't uh, took away free changes from basic economy tickets, which is what most people buy. Yeah. My number one tip is use those frequent flyer miles. I know a lot of us have them building up from credit card spend and we're not traveling. So if you want to book something, book using your frequent flyer miles. And if you want to cancel for any reason, you're not going to get an airline voucher. They'll actually give you your miles and cash back. So it gives you that added level of flexibility and, you know, use the miles. Might as well. Brian, real quick before we let you go, one thing that I've actually liked as a result from the pandemic is this change fee being waived. A lot of places are saying, you know what, if you change your mind, you can keep your money with us, but, you know, you can use it for a subsequent ticket. Do you think that's going to stick around? Um, Absolutely not. I mean, (laughs) Uh In some ways, we're already seeing tons of bogus fees being added in, cleaning fees, COVID fees. I recommend eagle eye your your reservations and push back on these bogus fees, especially if you're at a hotel and they're charging you know a COVID fee, but then you don't actually get any of the perks that you paid for. You can actually dispute those fees. A lot of the hotel apps, you can send a message to customer service saying, I'm not paying a $40 resort fee when I couldn't even use the pool. So you got to be vigilant. Oh, I didn't vigilant, even think of that. That's a good point. Oh, that's, that's so good, good. You've crushed right. my dreams a little bit, but then yeah. yeah. Then yeah. Built them back up. Yes. <laughs> Brian, thank Fight you. Fight for those 40 bucks. All right. The points guy, Brian <laughs> Kelly. Thanks so much. Every cent matters. It does. It does. <laughs> Coming up as the post-pandemic hiring crisis looms, some businesses may have found a workaround. Their summer solution? Teenagers. We'll explain next. For many teenagers, a summer job is a great way to make a few extra bucks while you're out of school. But for businesses, well, those young people are filling a critical gap in the labor market. I was a sandwich artist myself in my day. In May, more than a third of teenagers from 16 to 8, 19 had jobs. And that's the highest level since 2018, according to the Bureau of Labor Statistics. NBC News senior business correspondent Stephanie Rule takes a closer look. Hey there, Lindsay and Joe. As the economy is recovering, employers are struggling to hire enough workers, and it's creating the biggest teen hiring boom in over a decade. Tina Phillips owns the famous 4th Street Cookie Company in Philadelphia. That's $4. As restrictions ease, customers are coming back. But when it comes to getting employees back, that's been a different story. We're about up to eight people. We're still looking for four more. To fill those jobs, she's turned to an unlikely group, teenagers. If it were a different summer, would you be taking the resumes and bringing on 15, 16 year olds? If you asked me that before, I would say no, because I know they have to go back to school. Julie Hollihan owns a nearby business and says she's experiencing the same thing. Right now we are currently have three teenagers working and I would say that's probably three more than we had 15 months ago. In May, more than 33 percent of 16 to 19 year olds had a job, the highest level since 2008. Part of what's causing more teenagers to be hired now is really their availability and their willingness to take many jobs that perhaps other adults are not rushing into right now. But hiring teens is complicated. There are regulations about the jobs they can have and the hours they can work. And come fall, many will quit to return to school. But with a record 9.3 million job openings, many employers are willing to accept that, even if it's just a temporary fix. For now, teenagers are filling an important gap, helping the economy and helping teens themselves grow. The best part about having a job is being able to make money on your own, not rely on anyone else but yourself. Now I get my money and I'm just saving it. It gives you a chance to let go out into the real world. Now, this teen hiring surge might not last beyond summer, as we're expecting older workers to return once the employment benefits from the pandemic start to run out. Joe, Lindsay.
Hey, NBC News viewers, thanks for checking out our YouTube channel. Subscribe by clicking on that button down here and click on any of the videos over here to watch the latest interviews, show highlights, and digital exclusives. Thanks for watching.